the length of the fingers and particularly the second and the fourth digits are determined during development by the load of testosterone from the mother that the fetus is exposed to. The higher that is, the shorter the index finger is. Shorter index finger means that you are on the whole more likely to be promiscuous. Do you ever find it annoying to be so well known for one landmark concept like Dunbar's number? Um, I have to say sometimes, but, um, you know, there are only about, I'm told, uh, 10 people who have a number named after them, and I'm the only one that's alive. No way. <laughs> Something like that. Wow. Well, that's <laughs> Which a... is a bit worrying. <laughs> oh, well, you think that they're killing off the people that numbers are named after? Mm, who knows? <laughs> Yeah, you never, you never do know. So originally, I wanted to talk about friendships, but we're going to do that another time. You have a book that explains very interestingly from an evolutionary psychology basis, what is happening when we fall in love, what happens when we fall out of love. So it's just a, an absolute primer. How do you define love? What is it? I, well, I, I think humans have spent the last umpty thousand years trying to figure out how to define love and the answer is it is very difficult um it's clear that something weird goes on in the brain uh, in fact the brain goes completely crazy um uh, and uh we kind of become fixated if you like is what effectively happens on a particular person um and uh i mean it's it, it's kind of easy to describe the appearance of somebody in love. I mean, all the great poets and Shakespeare and et cetera, et cetera, kind of do it extremely well. Essentially, you know, they get this sort of dreamy uh, appearance and, and they can't get the person out of their mind and they want to be near the person, all these kind of things. But trying to understand what is actually going on inside the mind really has been a bit of a nightmare. But the reality is all cultures have or experience uh, something very similar along these lines. That's not to say that every person in a given culture experiences it. Some people are constantly falling in love. <laughs> and like mm, every time a new person comes in the room, they fall in love with them. And other people don't fall in love particularly with anybody. Yeah, they get on fine with them and they maybe have babies with them, but, you know, they're not, it's a bit give or take, you know, um, uh, uh, as you might say, they, they're not, they don't have that sort of commitment. So I suppose there is a sense in which there's a, a feeling of commitment of um, rosy sunglasses, this person is the most wonderful person I've ever met, all these kind of cliches. You know, cliches are true, They're based on observation of fact. <laughs> what makes us fall in love with somebody then? How can we reliably fall in love with someone? Oh, I don't think you can. I think it just overwhelms you when you least expect it. And sometimes it can happen... Uh, if you like, after the event. So one of the characteristic things they of people who have um, been in arranged marriages will tell you is, you know, you get ordered by your parents to marry this person and you think, oh, my God. Um, and then, you know, lo and behold, a little way in, you kind of just fall in love with them. It, you know, it, it just seems to work like that. I and, mean, you know, we uh, kind of prefer to fall in love first before we marry people. Well, you know, that doesn't always work out either. <laughs> so, you know, there is no no rule uh, that's universal to these things. It, it, it sometimes happens, it sometimes doesn't. It's hard to say, I would figure anyway, hard to say why it happens in particular cases. Often we don't really know. It's, it's It really is one of the great mysteries of the universe. And it's a great trauma <laughs> very often. Well, that's the thing, right? It's not just an enjoyable experience. It can often cause the worst psychological pain that many people will go through in their lives. Oh, yes. I mean, if you look at, you know, all the great love poetry from the wonderful stuff the Persians produced and the Arabs produced, um, right the way through to, to, to the modern day, even in, in, in the poetry, love poetry of other, um, you know, sort of 
non-Euro Middle Eastern cultures elsewhere in the world, it's it's all very similar. And it's the it's the trauma of unrequited love that it really carries the weight, as it were, you know, sort of. What do you think is happening evolutionarily there? Is that somebody lusting after someone and fearing that they are being told their genes are not good enough? That sounds very cruel. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm trying to break it down into your language here, Robin, unless you want to start pontificating about some romance language poetry stuff. <laughs> well, the great mystery is why we have this kind of uh, falling in love phenomenon. And we might think of it in terms of pair bonding, because what it does is create this very intense, emotionally intense pair bond between two people. And that is kind of unusual. It's certainly very unusual in mammals to have those kind of one-on-one -on -one monogamous relationships. It's the only group of um, mammals that is 100% uh, monogamous in that sense are actually the dog family, so the wolves and the foxes and all that lot. Um, most mammals aren't. They're promiscuous or they you know, have kind of harem-type um, mating systems, families, you know, male and several females. And females, sorry, humans have this very peculiar halfway house, which is something that looks like monogamy in the sense that it's you've got this very strong pair bond that holds uh, two people together. But unlike all the um, proper, properly monogamous <laughs> mammals like dogs and gibbons and various other species of monkeys that go in for this kind of thing, you know, these relationships aren't lifelong. Um, humans have a form of serial monogamy in which people tend to move from one relationship to another, on average, as it were. This is not to say that some people don't have lifelong relationships um, any more than some people have no relationships at all. Um, on average, you know, most people probably go through a number of these relationships, some of which are uh, just, you know, sort of teenage crushes phase and then you know you end up marrying somebody um and maybe you know you, you part company and go off and marry somebody else and that may happen two or three times i mean it can happen a lot in in some untogatherer societies where you know they may have eight or ten partners in a in a life lifetime each partnership each romantic partnership, if you like to think of it in those terms, is quite robust and it lasts for a number of years. And then they get fed up with each other, I suppose, like we all do, <laughs> move on. Is serial monogamy what you would guess ancestrally is the sort of, I guess, natural state of affairs on average? No, uh, not really. Um, for humans, it appears to be something more chimpanzee-like, which is... Uh, Polygamy in some form, either promis promiscuous polygamy, as it, it kind of is in chimpanzees. Can you explain what that is? Um, well, it, 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 I suppose just thinking in terms of the way chimpanzee uh, society works, the, the males fight it out amongst themselves, and the, 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 the top dog then gets to mate with all the females. And this doesn't mean to say that the males further down the hierarchy don't uh, occasionally mate with females, uh, they often do. They try and sneak them off into the bushes where nobody's watching. Um, but they don't have a sort of permanent relationship. Um, the females rear the, their offspring unaided by the males, and the males may be contributing by defending a territory or something like that, or keeping other males, strange males, away from the group. But the males aren't really particularly involved in in child care and child rearing. Um, you might get some relationships that, that um, last longer. There's a tendency for these kind of systems, you see this in the gorillas particularly, where several females are locked onto one male. So the males in those sort of contexts are functioning as kind of <sighs> sumo wrestlers, if you like. They're the big thugs to keep everybody off off your off your back so it, it, sperm it, donor and bodyguard absolutely and this is sometimes known as the bodyguard hypothesis um and we kind of see that in humans too uh, a little bit 
Um, but by and large, most human societies are actually polygamous. Let's say you have a male with several wives. Have you got an idea of the upper bound of that? Um, I, I, well, if you look at some of the famous uh, um, emirs of <laughs> Morocco places or, um, you know, the... the um, uh, emperors of uh, uh, the the Mughal state in in, in in North India can run into uh, well, King Solomon, I suppose, is the other famous example. Run into many hundreds, if not thousands, of wives and concubines between them. Um, but on the whole, the problem is that you know if you have a few few males doing that, that means there's an awful lot of males at the bottom of the hierarchy who don't get a wife. Period. Um, unless they go around stealing them from uh, you know other cultures, as it were, and either of other the, tribes, either of those make for a pretty unstable society. It it makes for a very unstable society, and one of the consequences of this, in almost all these societies historically, is when the grand old man dies, he's got like a hundred sons, all of whom are gunning for each other um, to. Be, take his place as the next emperor. So there's an absolute bloodbath usually of, of rivals. Because to the victor, the spoils. To the victor, all the spoils. And the spoils are very, very rich indeed in these cases. It's not unusual. I mean, that's basically what happened un, under um, the Saxon kings in England, and it happened in Scotland with the Scottish kings, really quite late, running through into the 12th, uh, or even 1300s, um, you know, they, they were just, you would just end up with a, an almighty um, mess, basically, as different families fought over who, who was going to be the next, the next king, sometimes while the king previous one was still alive, <laughs> and uh, he didn't survive much longer <laughs> once they'd sorted out who was, who was going You've to be You've got to prepare, off. you know? It's like yeah. getting ready for a night out. The event is coming. We might as well make sure that we're all set. All right, so... Given the fact that you were of the opinion that uh, polygamy is typical ancestrally, or at least on average would have been not uncommon, how on earth is it that we have managed to wrangle anything close to a monogamous society, even if it's serial monogamy? Okay. Um, I mean, I think it, it's, it's important to see this in the context that what evidence there is, um, which is mostly... Um, uh, to do with the length of the finger bones, which is quite a good measure of how promiscuous society is. All our ancestral species going back to the Australopithecine seem to have been polygamous. They, they show a strong anatomical signature of polygamy. It's only modern humans. That's this what's known as the 2D, 4D ratio, the ratio of the um, index finger to the ring finger. Talk right, to me yeah. about how you can tell the dating preferences of a society based on the ratio of their fingers. Um, it it <laughs> sounds bizarre, doesn't it? But it seems to work quite well. And, and this was established um, uh, both in, in, in animals and in, in humans. So it works quite well in primates. Um, but it seems that the genes that control the length of the fingers, and particularly the second and the fourth digit, so you're... Uh, index finger and your uh, ring finger are determined uh, by uh, or, or are influenced during development by testosterone load uh, in, in the womb. So the fetal, uh, the load that the fetus is of testosterone from the mother that the fetus is exposed to. Um, the higher that is, um, the uh, uh, shorter the, the index finger is. So more testosterone um, is shorter index finger. Yes, shorter index finger means that um, you are on the whole more pr likely to be pr promiscuous, and they, and it's kind of indicative of high testosterone levels, them both internally to you. So some uh, male babies, because they're obviously switching over uh, from being a kind of generic um, non-sex. So so a female body form is the default. Yeah, I remember. I don't. Right. Know, I got to interject there. There is a. Um, I think it's called Gone Girl, which was a movie, kind of a thriller movie, a few years ago. I'm pretty sure that the line was in that, and the the female protagonist in it is very manipulative, and she 
uses this line that would have slipped under the radar for a lot of people, but she points at the guy and she says, the male form is an aberration. <laughs> and that's so cool, right? Because it's the reason that men have got nipples, right? You need to yes. be born with all of the elements, all of the yeah. individual bits that could make a woman, and yeah. then you you turn from a kind of nothingness that could be a woman into a man. And yeah. then that was why she said, she pointed at him, and she says, the male form is right. an aberration. Yeah, well, this is also what's known um, as the race to be male, because it depends on how fast the fetus grows. So it's a combination of having a Y chromosome and how, 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 how much fat the baby lays, lays down. And that switches the brain over from this kind of generic female brain into a male brain, which is clearly missing lots of bits that should be there. <laughs> As a result. Okay, so um, what you were saying before, the finger length, that isn't the determinant of the yeah. dating so, preference. That is simply a manifestation of testosterone yeah. levels. Testosterone yeah. is... So you're yeah. saying shorter index finger, more testosterone, it would appear. Yeah. More yeah. testosterone also correlated with shorter monogamous partnerships? Um, normally it would be... Uh, either totally promiscuous mating systems or mating systems in which males compete with each other for to monopolize groups of females. So what's sometimes known as a harem-based um, social system where you have one male so, uh, and a number of females and their offspring. So species like gibbons, which are obligately monogamous, very occasionally they might have two, maybe even three females exceptionally in their little group, uh, but, you know, 98 percent of gibbon groups in the wild are strictly monogamous and the pair stays together for, for effectively for life. Very long index fingers. Uh, no, no, they're very equal. Right. Uh, uh, and, and if you look at monogamous species, sorry, polygamous species of primates, they then tend to have both both sexes will have index fingers which are shorter than. Uh, the ring finger, but the more promiscuous sex will have relatively shorter um, index finger uh, compared to the female. So the, the males who tend to be the more promiscuous sex, will, will even in um, promiscuous species, will have uh, sh a, 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 a more deviant um, uh finger ratio than the females well you do and you see that, that in humans as well um, women tend tens to be... of thousands of people right now looking at their hands yes i know and working <laughs> out whether or not their whether or not their digits justify their desire to cheat or to go out and have sex with somebody tonight yes well well it, it, um, the, you have to be a little bit careful because the padding of the flesh and the muscles around the finger bases disguises the point where you should be measuring from, right? So you, you need to find the joint between the um, uh, finger, um, uh, the bottom finger bone and the top end of the first um, hand bone, if you like. Um, and, and, and the differences are very, very small. They would be hard to tell by eye, although I have seen some males with spectacularly short um, uh, 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 index fingers, which is just blindingly obvious. And you take one look at them and their behavior and you go, yes, you're an absolute bastard, basically. <laughs> not, not, just, not just in the world of, of romance, but in the world of work. Uh, you know, just you're my testosterone <laughs> coursing through oh, them. Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, just fizzing. Okay, so let's get back to love itself. I, I, I'm still not sure about how love is adaptive. Like, is it just yeah. ratcheted up attachment? It, it seems odd that we've evolved to feel something that's so yeah. weird and has so many downsides. Well, this is where it all gets a bit murky because it's not really obvious why humans should have these kind of pair bonded, if you like, to think of them as semi monogamous I think the fact that we have this capacity, just going back to your earlier question, is what makes it possible then to have monogamous uh, arrangements imposed on us. Because if you look at 
the 8,000 or so societies around the world, that's a, there are about 8,000 languages and each language is a different society, um, the vast majority are polygamous. And, um, you know, sort of a few men at the top. Right now? Yes. Well, even now, yes. Uh, unless they've been Christianized. The point is, the societies that um, aren't polygamous, that pursue a monogamous uh, family structure, are either hunter-gatherers, and so the differences between males aren't very great for the females to choose between. Doesn't you know? There's one can maybe hunt a bit better than another, but you know, uh, by and large, the differences are quite minimal. Or they're primarily being subjected to Christianization, which has imposed um, uh, strict monogamy or attempted to impose strict monogamy. Um, if you look at, uh, at, at, well, and I guess the answer is it doesn't work very well because we just have serial monogamy instead, which is effectively the same thing. And of course, there are some Christian cults. Think of some of the Mormon breakaway cults and, and the original Mormons uh, who first started it um, are still polygamous. And Blended the two. Well, yes. Uh, <laughs> it, at the, prob- the, the issue, though, is... Well, what seems to drive polygamy in um, uh, human societies is when you've got massive wealth differentials. And this is why you get the King Solomon's type of, uh, um, uh, you know, or the great Khans or, you know, the, I mean, there's this extraordinary uh, statistic from the genetics, which tells us that 1% of all the males alive today are the descendants of Genghis Khan or his brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and within the Mon- area of the Mongol Empire that he and his brothers, as his generals, conquer, it's seven percent of all living males of their descendants. You know, well, you know, it's easy to see why. It's because every time a city refused to capitulate to them, they overran them very quickly. They killed all the men and they took the women into their uh, harems, and that was the end of that. Uh, um, you know, so they <laughs> inevitably produced huge numbers of descendants. But it's remarkable that we can still pick that signature up now, you know, sort of, uh, what is it, six, seven hundred years later. It does seem strange that we've got the, if we're leaning towards uh, polygamy, as soon as we have the surplus resources to be able to afford a stratified hierarchy of men and men to be able to support many women and stuff. Yeah. It kind of is strange that we've got the mental faculties for love to be such a compelling, overbearing emotion for men as well, right? Yes, um, it, it, that's true. But I, I mean, it's just kind of um, worth pointing out uh, at first, though, that um, these polygamous societies uh, are all ones with very, very um, wide spread of wealth so you've got very very rich people and very very poor people which and the rich people the rich males become attractive to the women because of what they have to offer not for themselves but in terms of wealth because the big problem all human societies face but particularly so once they're kind of into the agricultural game as it were no longer hunter and hunters and gatherers is that the better off you are, the more likely your children will survive. You know, we know that from our societies here, you know, in modern Britain, it's, you know, absurdly still, still, still the same. If you come from the, you know, the poor end of society, your children are much more likely to get ill and much more likely to die. Um, so the issue, the issue, the trade-offs that uh, kind of women all around the world are operating with is, is it better to be the second wife of a very, very rich man and therefore have a big cut of, of let's say, the land for you to grow crops on um, uh, than be, you know, the first wife of a very poor man? And the interesting thing about um, falling in love and romantic relationships generally is the extent to which people are willing to compromise on their ideals in order to just get the best job they can get under the circumstances they face. In other words, you know, everybody wants to uh, marry Mr. Darcy, 
But unfortunately, there's only one of him and 500 of you. So as uh, you know, the, what do the rest of you do? Well, as as um, uh, Jane Austen, <laughs> with her acute observation of the foibles of humans, uh, ob- observes is you hang on and you hang on, you hang on, hoping to catch Mr. Darcy or one of the other rich landowners until you, the point you get to is the point of no return where you go, if I don't marry soon, I'm going to be too old to have children. Is basically what it is. So you marry the curate, right? You wouldn't have looked at him twice, but it's the best you can do. And at that point, the whole system will flip in and you fall in love with him. <laughs> so it's yeah, so this completely is, mad. This is what you were talking about kind of earlier on to do with the uh, arranged marriages. Mm. I guess that, well, two things maybe are happening here. First is that subconsciously a woman's programming is um, reacting to her ecology and her biological age yeah. and kind of this ticking time clock to adjust her attraction levels based on um, basically scarcity. And another element is it would seem like closeness, physical closeness and familiarity can breed love. Yes. That's what it seems comes from the Indian arranged marriage. Like you literally do yes. not know this person. And the very well, the matchmaking job may have been done perfectly and you may have fallen in love with this person. But I would guess that tons and tons and tons of people in arranged marriages fall in love more out of familiarity and closeness than some predestined sense of compatibility. Yes. yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that's the case. Um, but the, <laughs> uh, the issue then is why uh, you have, you know, you, what you have, if you like, is the generic system for humans seems to be a, a form of polygamy. That's the def- almost the default. Um, uh, why would you have a kind of this kind of romantic component to it, this this very strong pair bond, because you get that in polygamous marriages. You know, that's what happens um, when when uh, a new wife is taken on. You know, um, it's not because or well, sometimes it's because the, the 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 first wife who is always becomes the chief wife says you're boring go and find another little one <laughs> to play with um i mean literally that that you know <laughs> uh, is the kind of thing that happens or um the the husband actually falls in love with somebody else and wants to bring bring this new wife younger always always younger into um the household and then it's a trade off for the first wife or this is, this is the third wife of the first two wives as to whether they're happy with that arrangement or whether they just shrug their shoulders and go well, we can live our lives quite happily without uh, uh, having to be bothered by the, the, the husband as it were um, so uh, it, it's still a mystery in that sense so the, the question then is you know what's underpinned the evolution of this kind of romantic falling in love component so the classic answer has always been well it must be the need for biparental care human babies are born absolutely premature by a whole year um that's why they're all kind of floppy and useless and you know don't even smile at you (laughs) never mind any be you know behave in a an engagingly human way you need something uh to 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 sort of persuade you to keep investing in it until it's uh, have completed its growth that all other monk, monkey snakes do before birth um uh, and starts to if you like become more seriously human and it that is so taxing uh, for the mother that having somebody else around why not the male uh, to help out is um absolutely necessary and you kind of go well that sounds awfully like American culture to me in not real life. Uh, um, you know, where in the world does that actually happen? And the answer is, well, you know, sometimes in hunter-gatherer societies, you know, the men dandle babies on their knees and do things like that, just as all men everywhere do. Um, change the old nappy here and there, but they're not really that good at um, helping out. You know, they're much better when when, when the kids are old enough to, you know, fire a bow and arrow and learn how to do these kind of uh, useful tasks. So I deeply suspect uh, the amount of 
paternal care that humans give, despite desperate efforts to uh, claim that it's you know, part of our uh, nature, uh, simply isn't the reason at all. Um, uh, and, and that's because in the end, the people who are most valuable to the mother in almost all societies, and just as much in ours as anybody else's, is the grandmother and the sisters, and maybe your female best friend, that these are the ones that really make the, the business of, particularly those early years, um, uh, uh, possible, if you like, less trouble-free than they might be, do on your own. And, and, you know, sort of, yes, males are useful um, uh, if they're, own land that you can you can farm and produce you know lots of crops to feed your children on and all those kind of things and we know that's important we know from um, historical demography data for example um, from Europe that in in the 18th and 19th centuries that women whose husbands were landed peasantry so they only had a few acres you know they weren't the nobility they weren't even middle class they were peasants you know, a bit like crof crofters, you might say, in, in, in Scotland. Yeah, they've got five acres of land or something like that, and they, they grow a few lots. The more land uh, the, the husband had, the better the survival chances of, of the wife's children were. And, of course, you know, for landless peasants who were day laborers, that they, they earned, the only way they could earn a living was to hire themselves out by the day to, to help with other people's farms, you know, their wives, you know, had high mortality rates because when they needed to go to the doctor, they didn't have the odd fiver to spare for the doctor's fee. They, you know, uh, if, the, if they couldn't, didn't have any money, they couldn't buy any food. All these kind of things piling in on them, the same old story that we, we even now, you know, still have to cope with. Um, so, you know, yes, once you have agriculture, uh, once you have wealth uh, accumulating, then then the males can contribute indirectly. But that comes late, you know, that doesn't happen until 8,000 years ago with the Neolithic agricultural revolution. Prior to that, for several million years, our lineage, um, you know, are just hunter-gatherers. So those kind of issues don't necessarily um, come uh, work out and you know in typically anyway you might say well maybe um, a, a husband who's a particularly good hunter is the equivalent thing and the answer is not really in hunter-gatherer societies because if he's a good hunter and he can bring down mammoths <laughs> instead of you know a chicken <laughs> uh, always in those societies those big um, prey uh, that are hunted are shared with the whole camp it's only small things um that, that you eat within the family of the hunter on their own so you know it, it, it seems to me there really isn't all that much evidence to support the claim that uh this romantic relationship is there for um <clears throat> uh by parental care as such as the, as the technical term is and the the only obvious answer uh seems to be this is a hard gun problem, right? So what it, in effect it is happening is that the females are wanting to attach themselves to a particular male, essentially for protection. And in the kind of size of societies we lived in, this is only going to work terribly well if, if, it, if you've got both sexes locked onto each other. So the male has to be prepared to, has to in effect fall in love as well at the same time. Um, and the reason for saying that um, goes to um, the fact that recent evidence um, that's only just been published that for mammals in general, let's say all mammals from, you know, your humble uh, local mouse and vole, right the way through to humans, uh, the bigger the group uh, you live in, the lower the fertility of the females. Now in mammals in general, it's a very linear decline. So if you look at things like voles and 
uh, rodents of various kinds, then the bigger the social group, the more females in the social group, um, the lower the fertility. But what smart species, as you might call them, like lions, primates, uh, mongoose, that live in intensely bonded social, stable social groups and have form coalitions are able to do is shift that decline in fertility towards a bigger group size so that they can live in bigger groups for protection, mostly against predators. The offset of the bigger yeah. group with extra protection yeah. Yeah. is better yeah. than it, it you, would be if yeah. you were able to have tons of yeah. kids. But, but what happens is, you you know, there's only so far you can push that that effect uh, over to allow you to live in bigger groups because in the end that 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 decline in fertility catches up with you. But what you see in those species is a is an inverted U shaped relationship between uh, female fertility, average female fertility, and the size of the group. Right. So if it's the group's too small, females do rather badly. These species indicating these species it pays to be in groups because that solves an ecological problem for you. But there just comes a point where these negative effects on fertility start to overwhelm the positive effects. Now, the question is, what's or who is causing those effects? Well, for 40 years, I confess, I've been studying various uh, mammals, uh, feral goats in particular, because they go crazy uh, in the mating season, on, in the belief that, and therefore looking for evidence and explanations for the, the fact that males going crazy during the rut, as red deer do and feral goats do and so on, many other antelope do, um, is so stressful for the females that it causes infertility. I, so, it, you know, so the assumption is here, it's, 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 it's the you know, motor mic gangs roaring around the village at midnight that's kind of making everybody jumpy and stressed. And that's what, and we know that st psychological stress uh, suppresses fertility. The menstrual uh, endocrinology in mammals, and uh, women are no different, is incredibly sensitive. Any le high levels of stress, and this is partly in order to ensure that you don't uh, have a, 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 a menstrual cycle while you're lactating, right? So this, the, the, because that would mean you're having to, to gestate and lactate for uh, babies at the same time. Oh, so there's yeah. an adaptive reason for why babies yes. make you stressed. Yes. Well, not make you stressed. The system is just designed so that baby suckling shuts down the menstrual cycle. Right. I learned from, I think it was Christian Jarrett, personality psychologist, not long ago, that women who are toward the bottom of their social hierarchy can be so downtrodden uh, yeah. in terms of status, that they can shut off their reproductive yes. cycle as well. Yes. Well, this is this is exactly what's driving the thing. Because when we looked at the data for primates, it turns out that it's nothing to do with the males at all. <laughs> Sometimes males can be quite useful. Um, but what's driving it is, is something going on between the females. They're squabbling amongst themselves. And it's that stress. So this is not fighting. This is just what I sometimes describe as the London commuter experience. You know, you're just being jostled and hassled right. on the underground. You're very you know? sensitive of status. But the yeah. issue being that because it still takes nine months to birth a child, a woman who is maximally fertile still has a relatively limited number of children. So it's not like the woman that is at the top could give birth to so many that the group size could basically be, be unlimited. You still have a limit on the top. Yes. And yes. then the women that are toward the bottom, if the group size gets too big, there's too much hierarchy, there's too much infighting, too much squabbling, too much social pressure, yep. that's causing a, yep. a drop in yep. the... That's fascinating. That's right. And the, pro the problem is that once you push group size limits, they can see this in species after species after species of primates. And you see it in lions, you see it in, as I said, in, in, in some of the mon social monkeys, for example. The, if if you, the further you push group size or the number of females in the group uh, is cor the correct thing, um, the bigger the effect on everybody. So even though the top ranking female is still pumping babies out, the other nine or 10 are being pushed so low that the group actually can't replace itself. Yes. Right? Um, and this is what seems to 
cause or perhaps causes groups to split because it's the females kind of uh, wanting out from a context where they're just being pressured. I mean, you know, we, we've known about these effects for a very long time. It's been known in, in, in generally that stress um, affects fertility in women. In, in humans. There's the classic work that was done on the uh, marmoset monkeys, the calatricids uh, from South America, that shows that um, if, a, if a, a daughter stays in the group, she doesn't even go through puberty because she's being harassed so much by her mother, right? Uh, take the mother out or put the female with, uh, the subadult female with another male and within a month, she's gone through puberty and she's cycling and she'll conceive. It's absolutely extraordinary how how fine-tuned this mechanism is. It's like plants. It's the way that plants respond to their local ecology. And this is true, yes. It's yeah. crazy. Well, you know, you know species, species that have to be able to combat varying circumstances whether it's you know your local ecology as an environment as a plant or the vagaries of uh, the world in, ge in general if you're a you know, complicated mammal like a primate you know flexibility of that kind is the key to its success so and primates are particularly so now the issue here is if you're having these stresses the problem for humans evolving away from our common ancestor, the common ancestor of the chimpanzees and the um, gorillas, the great apes of Africa, so sometime around about 7 million years ago, give or take a bit, um, they're pushing out eventually. Actually, during the Australopithecine phase, they were kind of okay. They were really operating in a kind of cheap chimpanzee type of environment, a rather impoverished chimpanzee environment, but, you know, they, they don't show any signs of... Uh, increasing group size. But once you get the genus Homo appearing, sort of humans, if you like, proper, two million years ago, so our lineage really taking off, what's, what that's, what driven, what's driving that is a move, or what that's associated with, is a move out into a much more nomadic lifestyle outside the forests uh, in less protected environments. And at that point, you see evidence in terms of brain size for inc dramatically increasing group sizes. Now, what these species are all facing right the way through to modern humans is a need to live in very large groups with lots of females in the face of this pressure suppressing you. So if you're going to be able to live in these big groups, somehow you have to solve the fertility problem pressure. Now, primates have been doing that for 60 million years. It's every time they, you know, you get a new lineage in that's sort of increasing group size because it's occupying more predator risky habitats, macaques, baboons, ground dwelling species like that. Um, uh, they're having to solve this fertility problem. And the way they're doing it predominantly is uh, through female female coalitions. So you form a, a, a within the group a close bond with a. Um, uh, a best grooming partner, oh. and the two of you act as a buffer. So you, you know, end get... up you end up with the benefits of a large overall tribe, right. and you ameliorate the effects of the infertility by having yeah. a small, flat hierarchy, little yeah. uh, microcosm within it. That's, yes. So are we? Are you saying that women, females, ancestrally, and maybe even today, need to take care of their status? Uh, of how statusful they are and how they're feeling in terms of respect and uh, pressure. No, actually, no. They they're much less worried about status and respect. I was using status. I was using status as a proxy, I suppose, for like um, psychological. Oh, okay. Turbulence or whatever yes. it was that yeah. presumably the women that would yeah. have the most psychological turbulence would be the ones that were the most downtrodden. Um, Yes, I guess so. That 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 that's uh, about how it is. But uh, the issue at this point is, you seem to have two choices: is you either form coalitions with other females, who, if you look at baboons and macaques and the like, are almost always close female relatives. Right? They're little matri matrilineal groupings, mum and and two daughters or three daughters, maybe a kind of arrangement. Or uh, you might choose to lock onto a male. 
So in gorillas, you have all the females locked onto a male. They don't really relate to each other at all. Um, uh, but most of the time, it, it's it's female female bonds. Now, in some species, you get a bit of both. Now, the gelada baboon ha- seems to be one of the few which operates both systems simultaneously, and that's because they live in such big groups, right? So what they have is little harem-based groups where the females are locked onto the male, um, which buffers them against living in these very large grazing herds of sometimes several hundred. Uh, monkeys milling around and treading on each, on each other's toes. And then, of course, that's exacerbating the stresses within the little subgroup, the harm subgroup. So what they do there is they buffer themselves by against those by um, uh, forming these little female-female co- coalitions, except for the female that's got left out because she has no sisters or mum or daughter to do it with, and she locks onto the male. Uh, yeah, so you've right. got two two potential so, solutions here. That's right, and and they treat the male exactly like he was a female in this social sense, oh, right? And he treats her. So, now, I think what's happened with humans, this is kind of uh, still a, a, a guess, as it were. Um, we're still tr- trying to figure out how you can improve it. Is what's happened is as the group sizes have increased, it's become increasingly necessary for females to lock on to males as hired guns because females are no good as hired guns they're just not what do you mean when you say hired guns protectors cool bodyguard right bodyguard yeah is it not okay so if it wasn't for the fact that you need the physical protection of a male because males are typically bigger more aggressive more capable of doing stuff yeah but there is one caveat to this is 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 not necessary that uh, the the bodyguard, as indeed is the case when females are forming these coalitions in, uh, in these other species with other females, the female relatives, that this is a kind of defensive pact uh, by the military full of AK-47s pointing outwards. It's passive protection. Right? It's just that I know that when I am about to tread on your toes, that your best friend is five yards away. And if you go, ouch, I'm in trouble because I don't have to contend just with you. I'm going to have to contend with your best friend as well. And at that point, primates are smart. They know the odds are just not worth fighting. So they'll just detour slightly around, right? So it's a, it, most of it is passive defense. Now and again, all passive defense has to be proven at some point mm. by, by by genuine fisticuffs, if you like. Otherwise, it, it, you know, it, 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 it doesn't really work. But most of the time, it's just passive protection. It's having another partner that everybody else knows that's your buddy. So just don't mess unless you really know you're going to win. Is there... A potential argument that this, this reliance on is it allo parenting? I think where you have mm. the, it, it's sort of distributed between women, yeah. multiple yeah. women looking after multiple children. That not yeah. necessarily that. If it wasn't for the bodyguard issue or the hired gun uh, element of having a male partner, could females not just have been vegetarians, not decided to go chase something down? It seems like you know with. Uh, menopause you do end up having a surplus of women to be able to look after children yep. it's difficult to do that yep. like it, I, I can't remember whether it was in your book or, or somewhere else that i read that potentially the hunting part of hunter gatherers for men was more about judging male reproductive fitness yes. of whether he's a good hunter more yep. so than the nutrition that he derived if that's true that is one of the wildest things that i've ever heard no this is <laughs> This appears to be absolutely so, that if you look at the economic returns of hunting, hunt, hunting males like to go hunting big, dangerous animals in all these cultures, right? Um, the energetic returns on hunting big, um, dangerous animals are not that good, not least because they're just dangerous to hunt, and you have every chance of uh, not coming home yourself right you actually do better energetically to just shoot rabbits um but there's no demonstration of skill so if you look at male um courtship strategies if you like 
it's all about demonstrating how good I am. Uh, and it, by good, I mean how good my genes are. So if, if, if all the kinds of things that young males do, racing each other, climbing stupidly high cliffs for no other purpose than to say I've done it, uh, playing vigorously <laughs> brutal games <laughs> where basically you're just bashing heads together, all these kinds of things, it's argued, are essentially displays of just watch me i can afford to take these risks because my genes are so good they're the ones you want and of course there's no point in kind of making vague claims these things have to be proven right and the result is teenage males have very high mortality rates by comparison with teenage girls because they take so many more risks I mean, we've actually done, done a study on this at a crossing in the middle of Liverpool, watching uh, when people cross against the lights. And, and what seems to happen is, so we've got a very nice measure of how risky it is because we can measure how far away the oncoming car is. If there are women present in the crowd of people waiting to cross, males are much more likely to cross on their own, especially if the car is close, right? This is just advertising. Um, and, you know, it really is a case of chicken because you, you know, it doesn't work if some people don't pay the price because they get it wrong. So these pressures then seem to be spill over in, into to hunting. There's the show off uh, explanation hypothesis for, for hunting large, large, that's what it's called the um, show off show off hypothesis wow yeah. i mean that that is absolutely spectacular like, yeah. to think that it, it might not be a utilitarian i go out like robin go robin stab robin bring back like, it's, not, it's not about that it's about look robin competent yes Nate with robin yes robin got very good genes build, yeah yeah, build, yeah genes build very good body yeah. yes yes robin strong robin's fast sons brain. be attractive as well fast brain <laughs> yeah fast yeah. muscles okay, all okay. These kind so of things. going back going back to the pair bond uh, stuff what what is commitment in your uh mind then is it a hard to fake signal of authenticity that sort of encourages trust yeah, I, basically, yes. I, I think that's a lot of, I mean, the problem, this is a two-way game. This is not a game played by one sex and the other sex just sort of sits there and does nothing. Um, uh, th there is a caveat to that and, and, and uh, that, that I'll just detour for a moment uh, because it does kind of sum up the asymmetry of, of this. So we, we were looking at um, a huge national telephone database so this is all the phone calls made on one provider in a very large european country it's 20 percent of the entire country so we're talking about um uh, tens of millions of subscribers uh, and something like six billion phone calls over the course of a year All right now we, we were looking at the uh person they called most each person called most and what you see is um, looking across the age span. So as, as is always the case, we don't know what happened below 18 because that, that becomes minor minors and is a whole nother ethics issue. So nobody ever bothers about them. But from 18 onwards, what you find is that the girls start very quickly calling a particular number who is, when you check who that is, it's a male of similar age. It takes about three years before the male starts to reciprocate and put a female of his age in that pole position. So in other words, the girls have made up their mind long way beforehand as to who they want. And they call and they call and they call and they make sure they're there uh, when the guy comes around the corner and all these kind of things until eventually even the most stupid male goes, oh, Goodness me, <laughs> she uh, would be interested. Interesting, right? but, but you, doesn't this but run the against is, the, well, the the over perception and under perception bias? In this context, meaning 
the this fact is that just the f- their phone calls. I suppose so, but men, men are, or at least David Buss in his new book, he was talking about the fact that men tend to overperceive attraction from women, and women tend to underperceive yeah, yeah. attraction from men. Yes, you would yes. have thought that, like how how high do you need to wave the flag? Yeah. Men should have already been. Yes, but but uh, you know uh, uh, that that's absolutely appears to be absolutely true. But m- m- men don't pursue that for very long. I think is the answer. They think, oh, you know, uh, she's showing an interest in me, and then they go, oh, no, she's not actually, uh, because the women are being very choosy about their responses to the males. They make it very clear. Sorry, you know, go away, don't ring me, <laughs> don't worry. But the one they want. They will keep phoning. But what's interesting is, and this bears back on some of the other stuff we've been talking about, is if you look at what happens after that. Um, so this is a late marrying pop- population. Um, they uh, average age of marriage is about 29 in that particular population at that particular time. Um, <clears throat> so they're they're really they're they're um, got this lead in as it were, uh, in which the girls start very, very, very early focusing on this one male. The boys eventually halfway through go, all right, and then they get married. And then about 20 years later, almost exactly, suddenly uh, the wife switches, the girl switches to a female one generation younger. Grandchild's just been born. But the male has long since already switched out. He's no longer phoning his wife with the same frequency as he is. So the female carries on phoning and phoning and phoning the same person, but the male only lasts about seven years you know, with her in pole position. He then gets, if you like, he gets bored and he starts phoning other people. Um, uh, and, and, and what this looks like is very intense female choice going on. They're the ones that really decide um it, you know okay you can kind of force them to marry you in some way or another socially or otherwise um but you it's a, it's a bad deal if you do that because you have a very uh grumpy wife to put up with who didn't want to be there and probably isn't going to stay very long uh if you if you respond to the natural rhythm of the thing um uh, uh, then and let them choose, then you're into a good deal because you've got, you know, real focus and lock on. Um, but it seems the guys just drift away in their little social world, as it were, much, much earlier than, than the women do. Um, it, it's just so conspicuous when you see it in the phone calling data. What's the lesson that you take away from that? Oh, well, at, at one le- level is the choice is being made by the women. And it will work better if you just leave them to it. Um, the difficulty, of course, is it's back to Jane Austen. She was such a good observer of human human behavior. You know, people are being left out. You know, Mr. Darcy's getting all the girls, and you know, the curate's getting none except the desperate. Um, and you know, because Mr. Darcy is getting such a lot of attention, there are a whole bunch of guys who aren't getting any any. Uh, um, wives at all, which is effectively what happens in, in polygamous society. So you have to have a way of managing them. And you can see all sorts of interesting strategies um, through history and across cultures and how that problem is managed. And the one suggestion has been that this explains why the Portuguese started their explorations in, in the 15th century, because they had reconquered Portugal from the Moors uh, they'd taken over all the Moorish estates. The nobility that were created in the aftermath of that um, had enormous estates. They were able to uh, divide their estates equally between at least their sons, and their daughters probably got a bit of a share too. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, everybody was happy because they got a decent amount of land. But there came a point all over Europe this happened, in fact, um, where estates started to get carved up into ever smaller pieces to the point where they were no longer economic. So when this happened in Portugal, who were the first people to really show this, um, they switched to primogeniture, oldest son inherits everything. So before that, all sons had inherited equally. Um, They switched to primogeniture. That meant the oldest son got the lot. The youngest sons kind of looked very grumpy, started to be a nuisance. 
and basically they were riding around them in motorcycle gangs through the villages playing mayhem and beating the peasantry up and all these kind of things that, that people will insist on doing. Um, <clears throat> so some some bright spark said, listen, boys, you know, why don't you, here's a boat, why don't you go exploring? And what you find is that a, it led to this huge uh, exploration and, and conquest of, of, you know, the New World and, and uh, the East. Um, and you, what you find is the old, oldest born son dies in Portugal. The second and the third born son die in the empire, Morocco or somewhere else. They just get them out of the system. Go and make your own way. So you're saying that when the demand for potential mates outstrips the available supply, but you have a surplus of resources, you can basically pay men to go off and have an adventure, find some more women, find their own little yes. kingdom that they can go yes. make somewhere. So you can control single disgruntled nuisance causing men by yeah. using the thing that you do have a surplus of, which is resources and money. Yeah, but you don't necessarily need money. I mean, you just say go, you know, because this is how the Venetians solved the problem. They they never had this problem, right? They they maintained uh, equal division of, of the family wealth between all the sons, you know, for centuries because they were traders, right? The more sons you have, the more trading you can do. The problem with land is it's a fixed commodity. And, and you see this very nicely illustrated in the Tibetans. Uh, so the tra tra traditionally, the Tibetans are one of the few societies that practice polyandry. They have each, uh, one wife and many husbands. The husbands are all brothers. And this is a strategy to prevent. So what you're dealing with here is very high altitude, very poor quality land, uh, and not much of it at that. Um, and every time you divide the family estate up uh, between all the sons, you know, it very quickly gets down to one field apiece, and that's not enough to keep anybody going. So their solution is to marry all the brothers to one girl from another family. Because And the strategy works because the brothers are different ages. So, you know, when four or five brothers marry a girl, the oldest will be 21, 22, Something like that. The youngest will be five. They all go in as, and they're all treated as husband by the wife. But because of the age differentials, <clears throat> uh, they kind of operate a what's effectively a form of serial monogamy. Because by the time the next brother gets old enough to go, oh, it's the a first girl, one's bored. He's bored. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> except <This> is... <laughs> for except for number two. Right, because number two is eighteen when they get married. It's older brothers, let's say twenty-two. The next one is seventeen or eighteen. Now these, he's on the right on the, the the hinge, as it were, of getting interested in girls. So what do they do? They stick him in a monastery. So all these. This is why the Tibetans have this huge monastic culture. It part of it is to absorb um, the the excess sons who are always the second-born son. Wow, so you really didn't body. want to be the second born then. That was yeah. a bad... Oh. <laughs> well, it depends on how much you like the monastery, I suppose, and yeah. whether you want your older brother's ex-wife as your future yeah. partner, yeah. I suppose. Well, well, the interesting thing is you see exactly the same thing happening in Ireland. So we showed looking at the seminary records for one major seminary in, in Ireland through the 19th century, that the se seminaries were filled with the younger sons of big families. Right. They're all farmers. They're all, you know, petty farmers of one size or another. When the family got too many boys in them, girls you can always marry off, right? It's no problem. When you've got too many sons, uh, you've got competition for the land. So, uh, you know, if, if they were a family with a lot of sons, then, you know, the excess sons were persuaded that uh, a career in the church you're not is gonna very get, attractive. You're not going to get as disgruntled in the parish, perhaps, if you've decided to yeah. commit yourself to God. Okay, well, so you, you looked at... You know, they live very well. You know, the church looks after them. They get to travel. You know, they might go to Rome and become incredibly rich as a cardinal. All these kind of things. There are all these attractions to make it... In. But the, the, the losers here in these kind of systems, particularly in the Tibetan system, is the other daughters, because... Uh, you can. You're only marrying one daughter out of each family 
into another family. So you end up with surplus of daughters and, and for better or for worse, they end up as drudges in, you know, their sisters or their brother's households, literally as servants mm. in, in leading a very miserable life. But the Portuguese had that problem too. You know, they ended up because they wouldn't allow their daughters to marry out of the ducal uh, uh, class, right? the, the class of the top noble class of dukes. You've got a big constraint on the supply. Yeah. That's right. Now, so what do you do with all these surplus girls? You put them in a nunnery. And these girls went in with the title of Brides of Christ. That's what they were called. They went in with a dowry. And if their older sister died before uh, marriage or soon after marriage, before she'd produced an heir, the next girl could relinquish her nunnery vows um, reclaim the dowry and go back uh, and uh, replace her. I can her imagine. Sister. I can imagine that if you're parents, a, you know, they're awful. They're so it, manipulative. They are, they are. If I can imagine that if you were a, a disgruntled, unwilling nun, that knowing that if your sister died at some point soon, your older sister died, I imagine that that could create some perverse incentives down the road if you were a, a particularly. Uh, Wiry, yeah. wiry little nun. Okay, so one of the things that I thought was fascinating that you looked at was uh, kissing, the use of human kissing. What's mm. what's the explanation for that? Uh, it it it's one of those things again for which there has never been really a satisfactory explanation. Um, one of the interesting things about kissing, though, is in mouth-to-mouth -mouth kissing. I mean, not all cultures do it, so it doesn't necessarily work everywhere. But it, it seems that pretty much it, it's as close to a universal as <clears throat> anything uh, might be in that, you know, large numbers of cultures actually do it. The key to it is you're exchanging information on your essentially your immune system. So it, it's reckoned a, a, a five-minute kiss results in the transmission from one person to the other of tens of billions of um, uh, 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 chemicals and uh, you know sort of bacteria and all sorts of other things that that, that belong to your insides um, to the other person, and it's giving them a very direct measure of the quality of your immune system. So if you think about falling in love, courtship in other words, as a process of assessment. So it starts as you enter the room and your eyes look across the room and you go, oh, that's a very attractive one. That uh, fills, ticks all those kind of physical attraction boxes. I, I shall go and explore further. And you go closer and engage in conversation and, and uh, so then you're picking up all sorts of cues about you know, their back, cultural background if you like the, how they think and psychological background in, in the conversation and then if you're still if you're still happy I mean, th at that point you kind of go through a, a point of reappraisal do I like what I see or do I pull out now when I, I still can or do I go to the next level you go to the next level is a bit more sort of physical so you you you, you have a grapple and a dance um, and at this point, you can you can get a good sniff of the other person, uh, smell uh, what they're sniffing. Smelling important in humans. Very important, very important, because again, the same genes that determine your smell are the ones that determine your um, immune system. Right? And what you're looking for is somebody who has a different immune system. It seems that what what you're looking for is somebody who kind of looks like you in all sorts of ways. So it's keeping a good bunch of genes together from your extended family, if you like. This is what's known as optimal inbreeding or optimal outbreeding. You know, you, you know, why would you waste the fact that history of mating in your ancestors has produced this perfect person that is you? Why would you waste all that by dispersing it by marrying uh, or mating with people who are uh, not so perfect as you, right? So the answer is you look for people who are similar to you facially and all these kind of things, uh, look like you as much as possible, 
because that's indicative of the fact that you uh, probably have common ancestry. Um, and of course, in village societies, that would work really well. And it probably doesn't work so well for us because we don't actually meet people who really look like us very often these days. But in village society, you know, you can tell tell it our village from that village. They just look different. <laughs> um, uh, 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 and that's not just how they cut, comb their hair <laughs> physically. Did I see um, that you said that men can actually smell when women are ovulating? Yes, yes. Um, so, so th this is the point that, well, uh, we can come back to that. I was just, yes. just finished the, the mate choice bit is that the one thing you want looking for somebody to be similar to you is in the immune system, because what you want is your child to have as diverse a, a, an immune system as possible. You did the, the narrower it is. So inbreeding is bad for all sorts of reasons, but one of them is you end up with no variability in their immune system to resist diseases. When you say immune system, what do you mean? It, it, the body's natural immune system. This is what produces all the white blood cells and stuff that, that sort of attack and cannibalize. Okay, and, and genetically, viruses and genetically, people have a predisposition to be what robust against certain types of uh, viruses and, and bacteria, but maybe not all of them. So the goal is to kind of spread the risk across. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Or, or it's it's it, it not necessarily particular resistance, particular bacteria or what have you. But a, a very strong immune system, which is because the immune system is very adaptive to what's thrown at it, right? It, it learns uh, to recognize uh, foreign bodies that have invaded you. And, Ooh, so and this isn't just genetic. This is something which is going to be influenced by if you were an adventurer, if you'd been away. No, if you'd... no it's, it's, the, it's the genetics of the immune system itself, this capacity for the white, essentially the white blood cells uh, to identify and the natural killer cells, the NK cells, uh, to identify foreign bodies in your system and seek and destroy, as it were. And, uh, you know, what you, I mean, the, there will be an element probably from different exposures in terms of lineages uh, that have, you know, sort of produced some genetic adaptation to particular kinds of viruses maybe. But the essence of it is you want, as much diversity as you can get there and that s smelling somebody is as the sort of semi distance cue is the best way to find that out and and you know the, the famous cases are eskimos and maoris rubbing noses and we all think they're rubbing noses they're not <laughs> what they do is they put their noses side by side and they sniff and take in a deep breath and it's called, uh, I forget the term, uh, use, uh, the, the, how it's translated, but essentially it's breathing in the spirit. Is that the equivalent of the European air kiss on both yes, weeks? Yes, exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why people pick babies up and sniff them. If you've ever watched newborn babies, when they're being sort of passed around, everybody goes... Holds them up That's a big goes, whiff of the baby. And pretends not to be sniffing, but they sniff. There is no question of that. <laughs> so, um, and, and, you know, we get a lot of cues from, uh, much more cues from smell than we really like to think. I and mean, we're, we're actually quite good. I mean, mothers can tell uh, their offspring from other people's offspring by their smell alone. Um uh, the, uh, the, 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 the big issue uh, um, really in this context is perfume, right? Perfume, billions of dollars are spent every year on perfume, billions of dollars. And everybody thinks it's to cover up your natural bad odors. And it's not. You're, what you're doing is you buy perfume that exaggerates your natural your personal natural odors that's why there are so many different perfumes it was just covering it up we just have one perfume and everybody you know it's like old spice after shave <laughs> just gets loaded on. <laughs> no not 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 with women uh it's very carefully chosen to uh, and that this is kind of how they build up these perfumes is you know so they kind of match uh, different um, uh, smell characteristics, as it were. Their sniffers are extremely good at, at 
decomposing the smells in, in different perfect mixes, um, the, the, the people that do it for them. Um, but what it's doing is actually exaggerating your natural smell. Of course, it helps to cover up some of the bits you don't want to, 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 to smell of, but, but it, it, it's actually, you know, really part and parcel of, of the, and that, you know, courtship strategy. And that's why it's been, be, be, been you know, since time immemorial. Um, women in particular have done that <clears throat> or used it. Not to say that men also don't, but it's much, much more important uh, in, in the case of women. But your final, so you've had a good sniff while you're sort of grabbing the girl in, in a waltz or something like that, or pretending to dance very close in, in, in the club. Um, but the final uh, point really is it comes with kissing because that actually is direct uh experience of of um in saliva saliva is just full of uh um you know sort of immune system stuff as well as digestive stuff so it's it gives you a really uh, clear uh, message as it was the best you could do but that's your final because that's invasive that's obviously the final step in it so courtship is like this series of steps starting way out the distance cues, which are largely visual, getting closer and closer and closer into, literally into taste at the end. So. What do you think is going on with non-reproductive sex then, if you're using contraception? Uh, well, I mean, it's it. You know, sex is designed for for all animals, never mind humans, to be a pleasurable experience, and therefore make you keep coming back and and doing it. Um, what's interesting about humans is it's clearly geared to reinforcing the pair bond because the amount of sex that has to be done to conceive is just outrageous. You know, no sensible primate would ever, you know, uh, uh, waste so much time in sex. Uh, just to conceive an offspring, a lot of it's very, very quick. Three cycles and uh, primary, and 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 a female will be pre pregnant. It takes seems to take much longer in humans, and the the only explanation for that is simply to prolong the pleasurable components of sex to reinforce the pair bond. Because what oh. happens, right? In it, it, you have to remember, it, it's all about bonding, and all our bonding comes essentially through the endorphin system in the brain, which is part of the brain's management system for pain. It's an opiate, or an opioid technically. So it's rather similar effect to morphine. It makes you feel very relaxed and woozy and peace with the world and, uh, you know, trusting of, um, uh, of whoever you're doing the activity with. And, and, and for primates, that's done by social grooming, leafing through the fur triggers in, uh, the receptors in the skin, which trigger the endorphin system in the brain specialized set of receptors now we still do that that's why we go around hugging people and patting them on the shoulder and stroking their uh, arms and things like that um, but a lot of what we do uh, because we live in big groups bigger groups than any primate would ever think of grooming with uh, in other words it's intimacy you know you don't do it with everybody you only do it with the, with the close close ones but you want now want to bond a bigger group then a lot of the things that we part of the social toolkit so laughter singing dancing eating socially together feasting telling emotional sob stories all these things trigger the endorphin system and make you feel bonded to the people you're doing it with so are you saying so, that, are, you, are you saying that the difficulty of human females to get pregnant the fact that it does take uh, many attempts let's say uh, in order for that to happen and maybe concealed ovulation as well, or the fact that it, it happens without us being able to tell when a woman is like in yes. the equivalent of in the heat. Yes, yes. That is evolution making it purposefully more difficult or rarer to occur to encourage the man and the woman to have more sex, which yes. is already reinforced through the pleasure yep. response yep. in order yep. to increase the pair bond. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's because, so cool. That is so because cool. Because after all, as soon as uh, the woman is pregnant, you know, it it's um, job's done. Job's done. Well, you know, I mean, the yeah, okay, you know, early stages of pregnancy, um, uh, uh, you, you can you obviously can still have sex, but later on, 
you know, it starts to become. So if every woman got pregnant, tricky. the first mechanically tricky, if every woman got pregnant the first time that she had sex with a man, it yeah. would be very unlikely for them to form the sort of robust pair yeah. bond that they would yeah. need in order to be able to raise the child. Yeah. That yeah. is, Robin, that is absolutely fascinating. And it's because the, the reason this is working is it's a, a twofold mechanism in this particular case because the stimulation, uh, physical stimulation of the skin um, all over the body, the hairy skin, uh, as opposed to the palms of the hands, and the soles of the feet. Um, well, we used to think there were no receptors in there. There's some doubt about that now. But all the sort of hairy skin, the arms, the body, the hair, and all, head and all that, the legs, uh, are full of these endorphin receptors or the system that sets the endorphins off in the brain. Um, and so the stimulation that's given during uh, sex, all the massaging and, and so on and so forth is triggering the endorphin system like crazy. Um, and in addition to that, you've got a secondary system kicking in, which is the oxytocin system, which is designed around or what it exists for. Well, oxytocin started life in fishes as a, a mechanism for maintaining water balance in the body. So it makes the body complete gets sense. Flooded. Makes complete sense to me. <laughs> But in mammals, it had the opposite. It was adapted to keep the water in rather than out, and therefore it became very important in terms of lactation. Right? So it plays an extremely important role in uh, the course of lactation to ensure the, the uh, woman has enough liquid to create milk without you know, killing, killing herself. Um, and therefore it's kind of been adapted into uh, a, a hormone that causes mother-infant bonding and then seemingly from that it's been adapted to cause um, bonding to the, the romantic partner because of all the stimulation both of the breasts and of the vagina that trigger oxytocins as well. Oxytocins are very short acting. Yes. They, they don't last very long but they're very high. It's like a very high hard hit. Yes. Um, uh, whereas the endorphins are long and slow. It's a line of cocaine, not a tab of LSD. Exactly. I'll, I'll speak in language I'll, that, I, I, that I understand. I well. wouldn't know, officer. But um, I, so is cuddling the same? Is that the same response? Yeah. Holding right. Okay. Did I read in your new book, friends, which we're going to talk about another time, that the speed that you rub somebody with needs to be slower than? one and a half inches per second that you're moving across the skin yeah. in order to get the optimal endorphin response. And this is some yeah. uh, vestigial grooming, picking yes. bugs out of the fur thing. Yeah, it's it's three centimeters a second. Uh, if If you go substantially faster than that, it doesn't trigger the receptors in the skin. And that's about the speed with which the hands move across the fur, parting the fur during grooming in monkeys. Um, so they're looking for bits of rubbish and stuff in the fur and, you know, and so they're constantly parting the fur with both hands. And it's that movement deforms the skin and triggers these receptors. Um, and it's been shown with babies, newborn babies, that if you stroke them at exactly three centimeters a second, it calms them down when they're crying. And makes them, you know, if, if they've got to, to have, as they do, you know, a pinprick for the test that they do uh, with newborn babies, they're much less bothered by it. They don't sort of go, ouch, make <laughs> a up. Make a Maybe big scene. Know. I want to get back. Right. He's... But if you do it at 30 centimeters a second, it has absolutely no effect. I don't know how you rub a baby which is probably only about 50 centimeters long at 30 centimeters a second that's like well, i don't i don't the, know what it's you, the rate it's okay, the rate yeah yeah <laughs> you okay, don't need three centimeters a second uh, three centimeters of space thank you to do it on. thank you for correcting me there right so here's a question and this question came from interstellar the film it's by uh, christopher nolan uh it's spectacular and it's this question that stuck with me for a, a long time. There's this lady who has a felt sense that someone on a different, a, a distant planet is still alive. They're doing this journey to try and find a new world for humanity to live on or something like that. And in it, she brings up this question about why it is that we love people, we continue to love people that have already died. And if love exists to encourage childbearing and child rearing, 
why would we love people after they're dead? Oh, I think that's because the difference between platonic love and romantic love is uh, almost paper thin, really. Um, they're both based on, on the same framework. Obviously, warning incorporates a, a sexual element, which is very specialized because what happens with in the context of falling in love is the brain shuts down interest in other people. Obviously, this doesn't happen every time. But if you fall in love properly, then you lose interest in alternative possibilities. It's only sometime years later that you come out of that rosy sunglasses phase that you begin to become interested in other, in other individuals. It's very, very focused. Friendships are very similar. And, and interestingly enough, um, and this bears back to the earlier discussion we had about females' best friends, uh, this best friend forever phenomenon, BFF phenomenon, which is very characteristic of women and very uncharacteristic of men, um, seems to be really important for women. This goes back to your moral and emotional and physical support mechanism that, that they need when they're in uh, moving from one society to another and you know everybody's related to the husband and you're on your own. Uh, you know, your support mechanism is another uh, woman girl who's in the same boat as you. So, you know, you can you can form an alliance and then they're very important then in helping each other with through the business of, of uh, birth and child early child rearing. Um, those friendships are very characteristic. They're nearly always uh, women, very occasionally men, about 15 percent of Women's best best friends forever are actually a man, uh, which must cause all sorts of interesting dilemmas, which we well, need not go into. But the great majority, eighty five percent, almost all women have one, and the, and the great majority of those are another woman. And it, the interviews that have been done with women about these by the social psychologists, they just say, "I need somebody who's on the same emotional." wavelength as me many useless for that kind of thing uh, uh i you know that's why you know I, I i build these these relationships but i'm sure it's much more to do with the kind of forming these little coalitions to buffer yourself against the stresses of the rest of the group and to provide childcare support um, and and that kind of remains constant right the way through uh life um, and indeed your social networks are, are very, very gender biased. 70% of men's social networks, their friends and family are men and 70% of women's are women. And that num figure remains constant from the age of uh, five to the age of 85. It doesn't bat an eyelid. Um, you just don't see that kind, same kind of emotional intensity in men's friendship. If you ask them, have you got a best friend, male friend, they'll kind of go, Oh, yeah, I go drinking with Jimmy a lot, you know. But the truth is, if Jimmy moves away, you know, and goes and lives in Thailand for the rest of his life because he's fed up with wherever you live, as you do, um, you know, you kind of shrug your shoulders and say, oh, it's too bad. Um, I'll go and see if Steve's available. <laughs> it, it, men's friendships are much, much more club-like in that sense. So for women... Those fr their friendships are personalized and dyadic and very focused on the individual as an individual. Men's friendships are kind of more casual. Um, they may involve a lot of time uh, doing stuff together, but they're very casual um, and they're much more club-like. Why, why would that be adaptive for each sex? Well, I think, I think in the women's case, it's precisely because they're, typically they're moving between communities on marriage to um, a, a, an environment where everybody in the group, the community, is related to the husband. Yes, because the woman was the thing that was passed around or given. Yeah. The woman was the one that was expected yeah. to move. She needed a steady rock that would go with yeah. her. Yeah, yeah. well, she, she doesn't necessarily to go with her. She just has to be able to find somebody in that new Environment. Of course, all the young girls will also be in the same boat, so they'll share lots of things in common. And what's characteristic of friendships 
is you form friendships with people who are very similar to you in all sorts of different aspects, including, you know, how, how they view the world they live in and the support kind of elements that they need. Um, whereas I think the, the male issue is simply goes back to the fact that every single hunter-gatherer and well, you know, horticultural society, in fact, I suppose still in uh, industrialized Western societies, the male's most important function, the young male's most important function is defense. So they all have these warrior grades. Certainly once you're into the agricultural phase, you have these warrior grades where young men are uh, bonded as groups and they, they form very intense uh, friendships, but it's a friendship with a group. All the guys who are circumcised together, all the go, however, however they, you know, whatever the um, <clears throat> uh, uh, process of, of going from childhood to manhood is, always involves pain, some form, and frightening experiences. You know, so they'll take them out into the jungle in the night and, you know, and all the older men will creep around in the bushes and make howling noises and scare the wits out of these poor kids. But the result of that is they're utterly bonded. It's exactly what you see in the military even today, right? Guys are being shot at. It's terrifying. Forever afterwards, you're deeply bonded to, to those guys. Is the reason for the male friendship being able to be swapped in and out to account for the fact that you're going to have casualties then? I guess so. Yeah, yeah, interesting. That, that you 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 don't get so attached to an individual that uh, you're in apathy your mind, while your you're supposed to go drifts off something. the job. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. You know? So one one thing that I just thought about: you mentioned male and female bonding during relationships, oxytocin and endorphins. I learned last year about vasopressin and the role yeah. that it has for men, particularly. I'm less convinced. Oh, tell me. Tell me more. Well, it was, yeah, vasopressin plays a very similar role uh, to oxytocin in the sense that it was involved in water balance in some way originally. Um, it's certainly been banded about as the male equivalent of oxytocin, certainly in the early literature when they were talking up oxytocin as the uh, love hormone and the cure to, you know, the secrets of the universe. <clears throat> Um, and of course, oxytocin is primarily uh, present in in females. We're talking about female mammals in general, um, you know. So it was the argument was, uh, you know, it, it it's what creates mother offspring bonding in mammals, so that they will invest. They you know they don't nurture and cuddle this wretched little squirming thing you know it's not going to survive you know it's not built to survive on its own so you have to have something that makes the female just kind of focus on on uh, being completely altruistic and and and, and uh, nurturing this this little thing until it's old enough to stand on its own two feet and then they were left with the thing well you know what happens in um uh, in the case of males, uh, you know, you need something else if you're going to have males in monogamous social systems. This is all done on voles, you know, the difference between polygamous and monogamous voles. So what, <clears throat> partly the story was that um, uh, oxytocin played a stronger role in monogamous, in males of monog monogamous species of voles than was the case in pol polygamous promiscuous ones. But then somebody lit on to vasopressin and there was some nice Swedish work on twins showing that uh, males with high levels of um, vasopressin were more reliable essentially in uh, their romantic relationships. So males with the wrong allele um, <clears throat> uh, for vasopressin tended to be here today and gone tomorrow and you know they would sort of not very, they would act first and think afterwards let's say. Um, but it's not clear that, that it's really playing a very strong role. I mean, we've done a huge genetic study, um, and it was all done in Britain, so it might be different to <laughs> other people, um, but it showed no signature at all for vasopressin in any kind. We looked at three different levels of sociality, so your, your social predisposition, your romantic, dyadic romantic relationships, and your embeddedness in, in the wider social network. And, you know, 
dopamine plays a very strong role, oxytocin plays a very specific role in the context of romantic relationships, and endorphins, again, play a very important role across the, across the board. Um, but vasopressin, there was absolutely no signature at all, no difference. So I'm a little skeptical of the literature. <clears throat> People tend to latch on to something, get very excited about it, and then, of course, the media gets excited and it all gets blown out of proportion. Um, and the, the object lesson here is the vol studies, because it was all based around the difference between monogamous voles and polygamous voles in terms of oxytocin, essentially, oxytocin genes. <clears throat> uh, except that when somebody did a study of, and that was a comparison of two vol species, when somebody did a comparison of the oxytocin genetics across all vol species, there was no correlation at all. <laughs> with monogamy versus promiscuity. And then somebody else point, discovered that actually you can explain the polygamy, uh, promis promiscuity versus monogamy difference between the original two vole species, American vole species, on the basis of their endorphin genes anyways. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it all the vasopressin got wrapped up within the existing framework yeah, and it wasn't uh, needed. Look, yeah. Robin, you are absolutely spectacular. Thank you very much for coming on today. Uh, we didn't even get onto betrayal. We didn't even get onto the book that I meant to bring you on to talk about. So um, I'm just going to have to drag you back so you can have another glass of wine and spend an evening with me. Uh, if people want to keep up to date with the stuff that you're doing, either out of your work or, or online, is there anywhere that they should go? Um, really, the best place is... Yeah, the books actually. Um, the books are written for uh, the layman. They're me thinking out loud, really, trying to pull the big story together out of all the research we and others have done. Um, and uh, I hope they're a pleasure to read as well as being informative. They're meant to be informative. Um, so I'd go there. Um, it's much the best place. But it's been great fun talking to you. So, Robin, I appreciate you very much. Thank you. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace. <laughs>